Hello, everyone. It's 12 o'clock. Trying to get things organized here, but uh, I think we're ready to start. Appreciate everybody uh, joining us here. We've got uh, pretty good attendance uh, today for this webinar. Um, I just want to start off at uh, you know, hello. Uh, I'm Jay Kempton. I'm the owner and CEO of the Kempton Group and also the administrator for Advantage Health Plans Trust. Um, we're a 50-year-old third-party administrator here in Oklahoma City. And like you all, we're trying to get used to uh, a not so normal, uh, new normal, but we're making it. Um, hopefully you all are as well, as well as your clients. Today, um, I hope to explain the philosophy and the morality um, behind reference-based pricing and discuss some best practices as it relates to reference-based pricing. Many people think that reference-based pricing is just about saving clients money and reducing benefits costs. And for some, it, it may be. Um, but for me and the rest of the Kempton team, it's, it's a lot more than that. It, it's really about leveling the playing field to help restore uh, some semblance of a functioning healthcare marketplace uh, where low cost and high quality win the day and win market share. Uh, hopefully that day is, will also be a day when high cost and, and price opacity are, are once again a competitive disadvantage. Uh, the healthcare environment today is quite lopsided and you all in the broker and consultant community, you, you, don't, you understand that, you live it. Um, but it's quite lopsided. Much of the advantage is going to the sellers of, of healthcare goods and services, medical providers. Um, but in trying to repair this disparity in the market, we also wanna make sure that, that two wrongs don't, uh, don't make a right. And that's part of uh, what we're gonna be talking about today. To start off, I wanna give everybody kind of a level set. Um, and of course I can, I can speak somewhat to the industry we're pretty involved with the different trade associations that uh, tpas and benefit advisors belong to but i can speak uh, much more specifically about our own experience and, and i can just tell you that reference-based pricing is becoming uh, much more common um, for january of 2020 um, the vast majority almost 70 percent of our new uh, new clients uh, chose full reference-based pricing for their plan designs. Um, and these were groups that were coming from either fully insured or are actually more than half of them were actually coming from other TPAs um, that were not quite as adept or were not successful at all. Uh, they either weren't doing it or if they were doing it, they weren't successful in doing reference-based pricing and they came over to us. But all of Kempton's clients use some form of reference-based pricing in their plans, 100% of them. Uh, some of them offer it, like I said, to all plans offered. Uh, some of them offer a reference-based pricing plan option uh, in their overall medical plan uh, suite, may offer two or three different plans, and one of them is a, ref is a full reference-based pricing plan. Uh, but again, all of our clients use reference-based pricing for at least out of network. Uh, those are especially the ones that, uh, that you know, still have a PPO network in place. So, Reference-based pricing, everybody is, is worried about balance billing. Um, you know, what do the providers think? And, and these are just some of the things, you know, uh, it, it, uh, right now the hospitals um, are kind of the big bully out there. And I've, we've got the little PPO with the hammer tattooed to the bully's uh, arm. And that's really the, the, how it works is, is most of the lopsidedness in the, the healthcare marketplace, uh, it's, it's, medical providers are really empowered the 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 lever that they use against benefit plans is really their network negotiations um some of the things that that a our little mythical employer there may be thinking is you know your ppo agreements they're hidden from me i don't i don't have a say in those i'm not i didn't have a seat at the table when those discounts were, were negotiated the nature of your discount is confidential i don't know even what the terms of the agreement were the value of your discount seems illusory um, many times. Uh, you, you look at you look at the, even the amount after the discount, and you're like that. That's not a deal at all. It's not a good deal. Price competition is made near impossible. We'll talk about that. Um, sometimes, um, Mr. Mr. Hospital System, you choose ancillary providers. You know, anesthesia, for instance, radiology providers. 
uh, ancillary providers that are sometimes not in my network, which causes surprise billing, uh, which is a big problem nationally. Your ancillary providers, uh, when they're out of network, they're combat combative and, and they're very difficult to negotiate with. Many of those um, ancillary providers that are out of network demand full build charges. And the patients didn't have any ability to choose those folks. The, the hospital chose them. So that's, that's a problem. And the employer also, especially an educated employer, would say to the hospital system, your pricing is being imposed upon me and I have no choice and no say in it. So the broken system, really to summarize, buyers lose. Um, buyers are employers and patients. Um, you know, we have, have traditionally been taught that the actual cost of care is not really important. The, the true cost is not important. In fact, there's a, a mad rush in Washington, D.C. to redefine what price transparency even means. Uh, it shouldn't, uh, the, the, the medical community's uh, big, big health care will say that oh, you know, nobody really needs to know what the real cost is. All patients really want to know is what their out of pocket is. And that's, a, that's, that's not true. It's, um, the, the patient may not care what the true cost is, but they darn sure do care what, you know, what is the premium contributions that are coming out of their paycheck. So indirectly, they absolutely care about the true cost. Um, there's no resources to determine a fair price. Uh, cost goes up coverage goes down. Uh, again, we're all living that dream every year. Uh, so who wins? Well, the system wins. Um, networks and their, their uh, buddies in the hospital systems, they, do, they, they work hand in hand. Unfortunately, uh, costs are high and concealed. Uh, patients are generally uninformed and, and, and confused about price and quality. And there's no real, real competition on, on price or quality. Uh, hospitals do not compete, medical providers do not compete on their price or quality. They generally compete on network affiliation and who's got the best TV ads. Um, so moving on, uh, and I don't mean for this whole presentation to be a PPO bashing session. I have some good friends that are in the PPO business and um, you know, you, you get a, a drink or two in them and they'll actually start to agree with me on, on some of these points. But PPOs have kind of contributed to the problem. Um, you know, there's little to no uh, control of over the expenditure of plan assets, especially if you're utilizing uh, a PPO network that is owned by uh, a carrier uh, or an ASO carrier, or maybe is even owned by your TPA. Um, that brings with it potential breach of fiduciary responsibility. Um, a plan administrator does have the duty under ERISA to make sure that that expenditures of plan assets are reasonable, um, you know, and when you're paying for, you know, $70,000 for a, 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 a laparoscopic hysterectomy, um, that's not a good deal, and it's not anywhere in the realm of reasonableness. A lot of these PPO contracts, they have, they're very restrictive, they're proprietary, they have confidential terms, uh, impairs a fiduciary's ability to control and, and look at uh, and how plan assets are being spent. Uh, this last little panel there is a, is a uh, kind of an example. It's actually been pulled from a network um, that, that we've seen and evaluated. Um, they, they kind of refer to themselves as a high performance network. And this is just some of their standard language. And essentially it, it says that the buyer of healthcare, uh, the employer's plan and or their TPA um, has to rely solely on the pricing that has been negotiated behind closed doors between the medical provider and the PPO network. And you cannot go to an employer, to a medical provider directly to potentially negotiate a better deal. Those are, are contractual restrictions that are built into most PPO network contracts. And there's some of the standard, <clears throat> some of the standard language. Uh, so again, you know, there's bad contracts out there. Um, they're they're negotiated on the employer's behalf, but the employer has no ability to to, uh, to to evaluate them. There's limits and exclusions that prevent direct contracting. The discounts many times are illusory. They're a percentage off of build charges. Uh, an unknown percentage off of an unknown starting point um, is a problem. Um, that, that's generally how network uh, arrangements work. Uh, quality, you know, there's an assumption of quality uh, when using a network provider, um, but but I can tell you that, you know, some of the, the worst 
uh, from a quality standpoint, some of the worst um, physicians and surgeons and hospitals, they're in everybody's network. You all know that. Um, so th there is an assumption of quality, but it's, but it's, not, it's not really true. Um, incentives. There are some really um, conflicting incentives out there. Um, we can, if somebody wanted to send me an email, I could tell you more about this, but let's just put it this way, that a lot of network contracts, um, the access fees that an employer pays uh, to access some of those discounts are generally the access fees are on a per employee per month basis. But what you don't know and what is generally not disclosed is there is a discount skimming mechanism in there between the agreement between the, the hospital or the medical provider and the PPO network, where it's kind of like spread pricing on the pharmacy side. It does exist in the network side, on the medical side. Most people don't aren't aware of that. And so that, that really prevents a, a pure motivation to, to get the best deal. If you're getting a cut, of an inflated price. And the best way to have a, a big margin or big discount there is to start with an inflated price. And if you're taking a cut of that, you know, the incentives are really, they're, they're really out of whack. Evidence of, of, of what I'm talking about is, is right here. This is from our friends at Healthcare Blue Book. Um, if you have uh, listened to any of my presentations before, you've probably seen this slide. I, I think it's important. This is a, a, a basket of, of uh, common medical procedures. We chose Oklahoma City, but this can be repeated in really any city in America. Um, but these are top 10 or, or 10 common procedures. This is showing uh, the PPO network allowables, the range uh, from medical provider to medical provider within a given PPO network. So you may have multiple, multiple providers that, that offer screening colonoscopies. But the network allowable between those different um, network providers, you may see a low price for a screening colonoscopy of $1,077. That's the discounted price. While on the other side of town, you may see that the negotiated discounted price is $6,068 on the high side. Well, between that discount, that discount allowable at a thousand bucks versus six thousand that's a 563 percent variance as you can see each one of these common procedures there are huge variances between network allowables uh, the average network variance on these 10 procedures is, is 757 percent to put that into real terms to to hopefully illustrate why we should all be um, really up in arms uh, on behalf of our clients is if we were to equate a 575% variance, say to a gallon of gasoline, the equivalent would be two gas stations caddy corner from each other. One charges $2.50 a gallon, while the one across the street charges $18.93 a gallon for that 575% or 557% uh, variance. Buying fuel at the local gas station, that is, there's very much price transparency and there's very much price competition that goes on there. Just have a question, since you all are all remote, you can't answer this, but how long would the gas station that charged $18.93 a gallon, how long would they stay in business? A week? So they would have a choice to make. They would either have to become price competitive with the gas station caddy corner from them, or they get to go out of business. Why? Because nobody will buy from them. It happens in healthcare all the time, and there are no consequences for this. Why is there no consequences? Because people don't understand what's happening to them. They don't understand these price variations. All they understand is, well, I got a discount. Um, the PPOs really allow this type of, their existence allows this type of, of market distortion to occur and perpetuate. So why use reference-based pricing? I, I, hopefully I've made a pretty good case for it already, um, but, but some of the, the things that, um, that I want you all to understand as we go on through some of these slides is the PPO network construct is, is really a top-down negotiation. Most of the pricing negotiation is from the medical provider's charge master, which as we know, nobody should pay. It's that fictional monopoly money number. 
but it's always a percentage off of this starting point that is set by the seller, by the medical provider. That, that's a problem. Um, however, reference-based pricing, especially Medicare reference-based pricing, is uses a common publicly known and verifiable, independently verifiable base price. And, and that is the Medicare allowable. The, the federal government has spent a lot of time and our taxpayer money to derive um, these Medicare allowables. And so Medicare reference-based pricing, instead of using a discount off of an unknown starting point, this uses a independently verifiable base and then the medical plan would pay a percentage above that medicare allowable that is that is arrived at the the medicare base is arrived at not by the medical provider not by the seller not from the buyer not from the tpa or or from the employer but by an independent third party which neither neither party controls and that that's the federal government um, it can lead to much more reasonable pricing and also a level playing field for negotiation. You are negotiating from a common language uh, that neither party controls or owns. Uh, you have also you also have automatic price transparency um, when you're using an independent third party uh, base or index <clears throat> for the negotiation, because you know few, several years ago Medicare started posting their fee schedules online for every medical provider that that plays in the Medicare arena uh, that kind of builds in price transparency I want to give you all a little bit of a background on that so why does RBP exist we, we've already gone through it really you know the current system is un, unsustainable for employers um, reference-based pricing increases price transparency, competition. It can eliminate dubious PPO networks. I'm certainly not necessarily an advocate for the demise of PPO networks, um, <clears throat> but their current mode of operation is unsustainable. And they are, in, in my opinion, they need to evolve or die uh, because they are contributing to the problem. And when they come out and sell their price containment, their, their cost containment strategies to a consultant, to a TPA, to an employer. And when we know that their their method is so flawed and there are incentives where you know you, you can't with a straight face really answer the question, who does the network work for? Do they work for the buyer or for the seller? You know, there's laws against uh, an intermediary working for both the buyer and the seller. Unfortunately not in healthcare. Okay, so I, I like to look at reference-based pricing in healthcare just really through the lens of economics. And, and when you do look at that through the lens of economics, um, you can really see how special, um, specially broken uh, healthcare is. It's really kind of a unicorn uh, out there in the economy. Um, and just some quick examples of, of some of the things that, that you see when you have a functioning economy, um, functioning marketplace. Um, a couple of examples. <clears throat> you know, first I was doing some research last night about, say, you know, the price of a 60 watt LED light bulb. Um, we've got a lot of light bulbs in our home, and when we moved in, we had <clears throat> all incandescent. And so over the last few years, I have been, as one burns out, uh, going and buying new bulbs. And I can remember um, back in 2011, and I was able to verify this, back in 2011, the average price of a 60 watt LED light bulb, uh, standard light bulb was about 50 bucks in 2011. I checked it on Amazon last night um, and it saw a 20 pack um, for like, I can't remember the number, but I divided it out per light bulb. It's 84 cents, 84 cents uh, down from 50 bucks just a few years ago. All of this is, has come from consumer and or buyer driven competition. And it's all been enabled by price transparency. Light bulb manufacturers understood. We're, we're not gonna sell as many light bulbs as we want if we're charging 50 bucks a light bulb. We have got to figure out how we build a better mousetrap and we got to get that price down. They did. Now, I don't, I don't have the same sticker shock that I did when I used to buy a $50 light bulb. That was under duress. Now, it's really not a big deal. Um, 
So let's talk about healthcare real quick. You know, a laparoscopic ap appendectomy is different than a light bulb, right? You know, but it's also considered a routine medical procedure by the medical community, assuming that that appendix hadn't burst um, prior to surgery. But if it hadn't burst um, and it was just uh, inflamed and ready, needed to come out, that is considered a routine surgery. Prices range, you know, from on a laparoscopic appendectomy. You know, we've got a uh, you know, surgery center of Oklahoma, as you all know. I probably know. I have a very good relationship with those folks. They charge sixty-eight hundred dollars for a laparoscopic uh, appendectomy, and that's all in, all done. Uh, includes a surgeon, facility, <clears throat> pathology, anything that you need in relation to that. Uh, but we've also seen claims uh, right here in, in our region of the country where a laparoscopic appendectomy can be $40,000. That is a difference of 582%. Um, appendectomies have been happening for quite a while. They've been doing um, uh, laparoscopic appendectomies probably long before 2011. So why didn't the light bulb analogy work? Well, hopefully by now you all kind of have realized and hopefully I'm highlighting this, the prices for these types of common medical procedures, they should be going down over time, not up. Everything else that is technology or skill driven, over time, the pricing goes down. Um, of course, that's not how it works with healthcare. Okay, so what are some references? You know, we talked about Medicare reference-based pricing, but it doesn't always have to be Medicare. Um, some other references, if you start talking about, you know, economics and, and where do you price compare uh, one seller to another seller? You know, one of, the, one of the most common references that can be used for price comparison is the free market price, the market clearing price. You know, at, at Kempton, we are been blessed to, you know, we have access to hundreds probably approaching thousands by now of free market bundled cash medical procedures. Those are willing buyer, willing seller, uh, transparent price. Um, another uh, reference that could be out there would be, you know, online retail pricing. We have started over the last several years actually using, for especially for durable medical equipment, um, if, if the, the plan is, is um, reference-based pricing, or even if it's a PPO price. If a patient wants to go to Amazon and buy a piece of durable medical equipment at a lower price than what we know would be the PPO allowable through a DME company, most of our plans fully allow that. The patient submits a self-pay claim and we pay it. Um, there's no discount. It was just uh, the online price and so many times it's half the PPO allowable. So online pricing can certainly be a, a reference. Medicare, again, I talked about it earlier, is probably the, the best, at this point, the best reference, most comprehensive, has the most um, medical procedures are captured under Medicare. Um, there's a few pediatric procedures that are not, um, but there's other methods to get around that. But Medicare is the most comprehensive. It is publicly available. Uh, nobody controls it. Uh, mostly, um, there is ways to influence your Medicare reimbursement if you're a savvy medical provider, but um, but, but for the most part, it is independent. So it's it's a good reference. Um, yeah, so let's, let's move on <clears throat> after that. So reference-based pricing is is a common language. We talked about that. I wanted to give you all some examples of some medical procedures and how the PPO allowable compares to Medicare? And how does the PPO allowable compare to, say, a market clearing price, a, a Kempton Premier provider or a KPP free price as a percentage of Medicare? Uh, as you can see there, uh, Medicare is, is at that 100%. It's it's 100% of Medicare. The percentage over on the uh, over there on the left is um, are the Medicare percentiles. You see for this knee replacement, build charges uh, for this medical provider coming in about 427% of Medicare. After the, the network provided their discount off of the that bill charge, well, what is the discounted amount if we were to index it to Medicare? Well, it brought that down to about 317% above Medicare. 
um, the RBP, um, say an elevated RBP level um, would be 200%. Uh, a default level for, for Kempton's clients is 160% of Medicare. And then the free market price or the, the Kempton Premier provide, provider price as a percentage of Medicare is about 116% of Medicare. Um, that 116% of Medicare, that wasn't negotiated. That was not with where the, 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 the buyer had some big uh, amount of leverage over the seller. That is a price that was, was arrived at and offered um, willingly um, from a, a free market minded uh, bundled cash provider. So when we start talking about this, if you were to build a reference-based pricing plan uh, around a percentage above Medicare, what would be a good starting point? Now, I don't have this on, on, the, on the presentation, but I'm going to read them to you. You can jot them down if you'd like, but, but Kempton's default values that we use, uh, again, it's a starting point. We have some clients that accept these values. We have some clients that, that uh, choose to, to be a little bit more rich, but the default values that we use uh, on a Medicare reference-based pricing plan is 160% of the provider's Medicare for facility claims, hospital, clinic claims, et cetera. On the physician side of the bill, specialist, primary care, you name it, um, the, the default value is 130% of the provider's Medicare. Lab uh, is generally right at Medicare, 100% of Medicare. Uh, anesthesia is about 250% of Medicare, which is a, a kind of that default starting point. And, and default starting point means if the claim, when the claim comes in on a Medicare reference-based pricing plan, we're going to pay that claim per the plan benefits to these values. If the medical provider doesn't accept those and, and chooses to balance bill, we can negotiate uh, up from that, um, you know, using different methods and making sure that uh, the plan is still protected. But those are starting points. Um, CRNA, Certified Registered Nurse, nurse Anesthetists, um, those are also at 200% of Medicare and emergency department claims uh, are 200% of Medicare. Um, you know, again, about 98% of all reference-based pricing claims are paid at these values and are accepted uh, by the medical community without any balance billing. Also, <clears throat> You know, just to remind everybody, you know, under ERISA, which most single employer, most self-funded plans are, are under ERISA, single employer or multi, um, the plan administrator can and certainly does have the discretion to negotiate and settle claims and pay a higher percentage of Medicare, taking care that that the reimbursement is not um, uh, is not arbitrary or capricious and and the uh, uh, the negotiation is reasonable. Okay, um, so we looked at some of the average allowables on the previous slide. You can see gallbladder removals. You know that that that, that price bill charges is is sky high. Uh, it kind of moves on from there. But let's look at some not surgeries. Let's look at some much more common procedures and how they compare, say, to <clears throat> to Medicare. Um, psychotherapy visits. <clears throat> the average PPO allowable is seventy five dollars. What is that on a percentage of Medicare? Well, it's about 60% of Medicare on, on average. So <clears throat> if you had a reference-based pricing plan that paid physician visits at 130% of Medicare, which is the default value that we like or that we use, you can see for that psychotherapy visit, that medical provider is going to be really happy because they're actually getting paid more than the average PPO allowable. <clears throat> they may reject reference-based pricing because it's simply out of network and, and I don't recognize a logo on the back of the hospital ID card. But once you have a conversation with them and explain, well, you know, on average, you've been getting paid about 60% of Medicare. This plan, which doesn't have a PPO network, is going to pay you 130% of Medicare. All of a sudden, they get really, really happy. But sometimes that conversation has to happen. As we kind of step through here, um, again, you know, these are generally physician visits. Uh, again, with that 130% in mind, you see some of them are above, some of them are below. The ones that are the one that's really out of whack is that office visit established patient level one. Uh, actually, that one kind of uh, 
raised my eyebrows and then um, some of my claims people were reminded that uh, it is exceedingly rare that we ever get a bill in <clears throat> for a level one office visit. Um, and so more, much more commonly uh, arriving at our level three, four, and five, and, and the, the Medicare uh, allowable compared to the average PPO allowable uh, is very, very close. And again, that 130% is, is very acceptable and very fair. So you remember back to our, our slide at the beginning when we talked about uh, the, the bully, um, you know, we, we do talk to a lot of hospital systems. We try to keep very good relationships with the medical community. I think that's key for any TPA that's doing this, uh, any, any consultant as well. <clears throat> and, you know, we had the bully that was the hospital system and uh, their hammer was the PPO network contract. Now with RBP, the hospital system may look at the employer uh, as now as the bully um, and RBP is their hammer. The hospital may say, you know, hey, how dare you? I never agreed to this reimbursement level. Um, I believe negotiating jeopardizes my existing PPO agreement. So I, I may not want to negotiate with you. These are all things that we've heard commonly. Uh, I think Medicare pricing isn't high enough. Uh, this margin doesn't work for my budget. Um, I must overcharge some to compensate for all my uncompensated care. Of course, Medicare takes that into consideration. Of course, they don't want to. They don't really want to talk about that, but but it does. Um, my team's favorite. Uh, it is it is shocking how often we hear this phrase uh, come out of a medical provider's mouth, especially a large hospital system. It's kind of funny but um, they must have all uh, gone to the same seminar, but we generally will hear at some point in the conversation, you realize that we operate on razor thin margins. Um, and then the most important, most salient part of this is your pricing is being imposed on me. And, and you know, they're right, they are right. And so RBP puts the employer in complete control or the, the plan in complete control of what, what his or her health plan pays. And so an employer may, or a TPA may say, you know, okay, Mr. Hospital System, now how does that feel? Uh, but again, you know, like we've been told all of our lives, two wrongs don't make a right. So is there a right way to do reference-based pricing where you can live in, in harmony with the medical community? And, and the answer is yes, we believe that there certainly is. Um, you know, if you make the big step to go reference-based pricing, you know, you, you, you certainly, you don't want the initiative to fail. Uh, you don't, nor do you want, you don't want it to fail on behalf of the plan. And you also don't want employees to be financially hurt um, by this decision. So you've got to do it right. You've got to frame the decision correctly with the employee population. <clears throat> this is where a lot of folks go wrong. Uh, sometimes, God bless them, but but HR says, I just want it easy on my employees. I just don't want my employees to have to think, and I just want the easy button for my employees. And that's a key component to failure of reference-based pricing plans. Reference-based pricing is about choice. Uh, it's also about empowerment and a healthy dose of personal responsibility and consumerism. Um, as Americans, we're really good at buying things. Uh, we can discern value better than probably any other um, people on the on planet Earth. But when it comes to buying medical care, we somehow have been conditioned to just turn that gene off, and that's got to change. Reference-based pricing it must be done right. It must be done professionally with solid processes in place and also participant education and participant advocacy has gotta be there. Uh, the employee cannot be an afterthought. Um, HR and the TPA cannot do successful, or, and I gotta include the consultant there too. HR, the consultant and the TPA cannot make a successful reference-based pricing plan alone. The employees and their dependents must be part of the solution. They have got to be educated and made aware of what's going on. They must participate in the education and the understanding of their responsibilities. Taking patients out of the decision-making process, this is exactly how we got in this mess in the first place. We've got to get the, the consumer gene in, in everybody has got to be reactivated if they're in a, re, if they're in a reference based pricing plan. A superior solution uh, is available. Um, 
we view RBP as potential for mutual cooperation versus a punishment um, or a demand. Um, you know, we've talked about how PPOs work. Um, you know, you you've if you're going to go reference-based pricing, you're going to replace the PPO network. You have to replace that um, with, you know, a really best-in-class um, Medicare reference-based pricing vendor. Some TPAs can do it in-house. <clears throat> For us, it was a big enough lift that we felt it was important and probably more economical to outsource it to somebody that specialized in that. Back to the participants. Um, when educating the, the participants, they really need to understand why the employer has made the decision to go reference-based pricing and how to talk to providers uh, about their plan. Um, you, you've got to provide those patients with uh, pre-service and post-service advocacy. You've got to be able to educate and, and, and negotiate with the provider community, preferably in advance, uh, if possible. And, and we're going to talk about direct contracting here in a minute, which is a key piece of, of the puzzle. You also need a, a integrated legal support uh, for patients that are dealing with difficult medical providers. And there are some out there. Um, I want to give an example. Uh, I've been on a reference-based pricing plan here at the Kimpton Group. We we offer one in a, a suite of, I think we have two other plans that are network plans, and we have one reference-based pricing plan. <clears throat> when we first offered it, I was one of the first ones to sign up for it, and I've been on it myself, my wife, and my two uh, college-age kids, and I've been pretty healthy, um, but I do I do have some medical um, issues and uh, not anything big, but but I do have exposure to the medical community. And, and a great story, I'm going to take just a minute or two to tell this story, was when I was referred, uh, 50 years old, I was referred to the dermatologist for the first time. You should give a, you know, a check out, you know, check, check out all those little moles and, and everything and make sure you don't have anything going on. And this was the first <clears throat> new medical provider that I didn't know um, that I was being referred to. And so when I walked in there, uh, like any other patient on a reference-based pricing plan, the first thing I was asked is I need uh, your ID and I need your benefits card. And I gave it to the clerk and they did the standard, or you can just see what they're thinking. They're looking at the ID card, they're flipping it back and forth. They're looking for a logo that matches the list of contracted networks that is uh, tacked to their bulletin board uh, behind the counter. And they didn't see it. They didn't see any network affiliation. So the clerk said, you know, I don't think we take your insurance, sir. And I said, well, you do. I, I know you do. She says, well, I, I, I don't recognize a logo. And so I really had to kind of think of my feet. This was kind of a trial. This is going to be a trial. Is, is Jay going to be able to sell this? Um, what we've been trying to tell others to sell um, when they have this same circumstance come up. And I, I said, you know, I know you take this insurance because here in the waiting room, again, dermatologist, most of the folks that I was sitting in the waiting room with were some seasoned citizens. Um, some of them quite a bit older than I, Medicare age. And I said, you know, um, most of these folks are on Medicare that you've got out in your waiting room, right? And said, the clerk said, yes. I said, well, my plan is going to pay you what you're getting paid on these folks plus more. And she says, well, I, I, I'm going to have to talk to somebody because I don't, I don't think we do that. I don't think we allow for that. So she referred me over to uh, or got the, the office manager and said, you know, hey, how can I help you? And the clerk kind of told her side of the story. And I said, you know, I'm on a self-funded plan. Um, my employer directly pays my medical bills out of their revenue. Uh, and they use Medicare as a basis for payment. And I know from the waiting room, you all have a lot of Medicare patients and she's nodding. She said, yeah, the majority of our, of our book is, is Medicare. I said, so Medicare, you all are able to make a profit at Medicare, right? She goes, yeah, we're kind of forced to. And I said, well, my plan's gonna pay you what you're gonna get paid on all these folks, plus 30% more. Do you take that? And she said, yes, we would love that. I said, well, great, here's my copay. And when you submit this claim to the address on, on this ID card, the plan's gonna pay you your Medicare plus 30%. And it was, it was great. 
Um, they didn't have any problem with it. In fact, they were pretty excited about it. But I had to frame the argument correctly. And I think that's where uh, patients are just not being trained uh, appropriately. So back to RBP vendor considerations. I don't want to make sure that I'm not over time because I, I can really embellish on these because I'm pretty passionate about it. But some RBP vendor considerations. Um, when you're choosing a reference-based pricing vendor, you need to make sure that their compensation is based on some flat, say per employee per month, per member per month. You do not want your RBP vendor to be compensated on a percentage of savings. And again, it is a it is a problem with motivation. <clears throat> it's, it creates a conflict of interest. You want it to be experienced with Medicare repricing. This doesn't need to be something that they just started doing two years ago. They need to have a, a track record with large volumes of Medicare repricing. The vendor that we use actually has administered Medicare Advantage plans for years before they ever got into the employer space. So they're very adept at repricing claims to Medicare. Uh, they also, you need to make sure that your provider, that your, your vendor that you use updates the Medicare fee schedules very timely. When, if there's an update, they're implementing the update. Uh, it's important that the Medicare reimbursement that you are telling the medical providers that you're going to pay is accurate. Uh, if it's out of date, they're, they're going to lose confidence that, that you know what you're doing. They're also going to lose confidence that, you know, that you're not being truthful to them. If you say you're paying them 130% of their Medicare and it's not, it's a problem. The RBP vendor has got to have a really robust patient advocacy and balance billing support mechanism, pre-service and post-service education and advocacy for, for members and providers, uh, balance billing support, which is post-service advocacy. Uh, you also want either the TPA and or the RBP vendor to develop a, and maintain a safe, a safe harbor list. A safe harbor list is not necessarily a list of direct contracted providers. It would be a list of providers that you're not contracted with, but they just happen to accept reference-based pricing. Like my dermatologist, once they found out and understood what the reimbursement was, they were perfectly happy with it. No contract needed. So that dermatology clinic would go say on a safe harbor list. And then also have a mechanism for second level <clears throat> provider negotiations. Some of the steps uh, to success are, we'll kind of start with the top slide. You, you want to make sure that the plan document has appropriate language in it. You want the reimbursement methodology to be described accurately uh, in the plan document. <clears throat> it's very important that that is disclosed to the to the member and it's really the guiding the, the guiding bible for the reimbursement methodology. You also, if you're going to be building a, an RBP plan language, you also want to make sure that there's some discretion in that plan language built in and acknowledged uh, for the plan administrator to be able to negotiate and settle these bills in a reasonable manner. It's it's good for the for for people to understand that that is is a discretionary role that is reserved for the plan administrator. You want supporting uh, language on the ID card. You got to replace it with, you got to replace that PPO logo with something. And uh, uh, you need to have that right language that ties in to the language that you're going to be putting on your explanation of benefits or on your explanation of payment if it's an electronic payment. You got to educate the employees about the process. They need to understand what, what happens when this happens. They, they've got to understand that. You also need to set an RBP percentage that strikes a good balance uh, between provider acceptance and plan savings. It would be really easy to set your default values at 350% of Medicare, probably wouldn't have a lot of balance billing, but you probably also wouldn't have a whole lot of savings. And so, uh, you know, negotiation 101, you want to start, if you're going to start somewhere, you want to start a little lower. You can always go up. Uh, and again, ensure balance billing support is available. Um, the other thing is not on, <clears throat> on our graphic, um, which is a large step uh, in the success of an RBP plan, is to incentivize through plan design the usage of bundled cash medical providers that are willing to offer an upfront uh, transparent price. Uh, it, guaranteed price with no patient or out-of-pocket costs. At Kempton, those are our Kempton premier providers. Um, in an RBP environment, a premier provider or a bundled cash medical provider is, is kind of the ultimate lily pad 
for the participant. If the participant is very concerned, they're, they're not good with confrontation, they don't want to have that conversation that, that I illustrated with my dermatologist, they just, they're uncomfortable with that, um, then, you know, if, if there's a, a medical procedure that can be done, what they need to have done can be done by a free market, uh, say a premier provider, then that might be the, the, the no-brainer route for them. And our, our RBP plans do incentivize the use of those types of providers with 100% payment, uh, no deductible, no copay, no co-insurance. And we found that uh, uh, premier providers and RBP, they really go hand in hand. It also can, provoke, can promote and motivate true price competition um, between medical providers. You may have a medical provider that I'm not going to accept your reference-based pricing uh, reimbursement. Said, so, you know, fine. Well, we, you know, this patient actually has three other options right here in their community uh, where their plan's going to pay it at 100%. Um, and 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 here are the prices in which they're going to accept. That can be a motivator for a, a, a medical provider to either offer uh, a cash price upfront or preemptively accept uh, a, a, re, a Medicare reference-based pricing reimbursement. Again, you know, let you, you know, going into a negotiation, you need some leverage and price transparency is that leverage. Okay, so employee education. We've got a great flyer uh, here at Kempton that we love that we decided to put in the presentation. Uh, it's called uh, Know Before You Go. Um, these are, are just some, uh, in, in with the, with the, uh, the red X, those are things that we, we try to, uh, those are things not to say. Those are the language that you don't wanna say. The green are obviously ones that we, we would prefer that the patient use. Language is a key component in the success of an RBP plan, believe it or not. Um, it's also a key in communicating with your medical providers so they understand what's going on here. Um, we, we tell our patients, you do not use the I word. We tell our, our uh, care advocates, do not use the insurance. Don't call this insurance. They need to understand that this is buyer seller. The employer's plan is a buyer of healthcare goods and services. If the plan is an unfunded plan and doesn't have a trust, then the employer is literally buying this healthcare, a portion of this healthcare, on behalf of their employees directly out of their revenue. That's not insurance, uh, and and so we shouldn't we sh we shouldn't um, make the analogy to the medical community that this is somehow insurance because if it's insurance, well, they don't like this kind of insurance. So, question: Do you accept my plan, Mr. Mr. Medical Provider? That's that's not a good language. That's not good language to use. Better would be, do you accept Medicare? Great, my plan will pay you 30% more than you get from Medicare. Do you take my insurance? Again, don't use that I word. Instead of saying, don't take, do you take my insurance? My health plan reimburses you a percentage above your current Medicare payment. Would you be willing to accept this amount without balance billing me? And if the, the office manager or, the, or the, the intake clerk says, well, why do you, you wanna know? Well, because I might choose to, I may not be able to afford to do business with you. If you're gonna balance bill me way, way above the, the, the default values, I may make a different choice. I may go somewhere else. That's really kind of a fun conversation to have. Uh, I, I hope I'm not the only confrontation. I don't view that as confrontation, but those can be difficult conversations, but those are conversations that absolutely should be had. The medical community has got to feel They've got to feel some price competition. Uh, they've got to feel that they are that that the buyers have options. Another uh, some other bad languages. I don't know if you're covered by my insurance plan. Um, better would be say, will you? What will you charge for my medical services? My health plan will reimburse me if I pay cash. Uh, Self-pay claims are, are are a component of that. This is the worst right here. Are you in my network? Um, better would be say, my employer is self-funded and pays my claims directly. There's no PPO network. The plan reimburses a reasonable amount above your Medicare rate. Or finally, I don't know how much Kempton is gonna pay for that. 
that kind of language makes us cringe because it really sets up bad expectations. It, it tells the medical provider that, that the Kempton Group is, is an insurance company. And oh, by the way, it, an insurance company they're not contracted with. So it also loses the leverage that the patient and the patient's employer is, is really the buyer here. Instead, it would be my health plan allows me to choose any physician I want, but I'd like to be able to use you as my physician. Can we discuss how we can work together? Uh, again, the, the language there on the right, as you'll notice, I mean, those, are, those are conversations that you might have with a car dealership or, or, or anybody else in, in, that, you're, that you choose to do business with. Okay, so what we're trying to get to here is a true level playing field. Um, and a true level playing field uh, where we can work really in harmony with the medical community without surprises would be reference-based pricing with direct contracts. Using Medicare as a basis for a contractual relationship with the medical uh, provider. Some of the things that we see when we're communicating and sitting down with, with a hospital system, for instance, is, well, they, they sometimes they view that, that RBP is a race to the bottom somehow. And, and we, we counter and say, you know, it's, that's not what this is about. I don't have a single employer out there that wants to harm a hospital. They want their physician paid well. They want their hospital to be paid well so they can have the best technology and the best staff possible. In, instead, RBP is really a common language for voluntary negotiations and understanding, coming to a mutual agreement on price. RBP is a great conversation starter. It should be mutually, it should be a mutually beneficial relationship, a direct contract between the buyer and the seller, and remove the intermediaries. We view our role as, as a TPA is we are a facilitator. We are an expert facilitator between a buyer and a seller. And we are successful when we can help enhance the relationship between an employer and a medical provider, between a buyer and a seller. Um, with free market and being a good consumer, there's also kind of a, uh, the, the other side of this, and that is you know, when, when to walk away. Because that's that can happen. That that's real. If if you're dealing with a medical provider that is just unwilling to negotiate using a common language, and and we we found uh, at least one, maybe a couple, of of hospital systems here in Oklahoma that they really like the status quo. Um, they really like um, the the bully slide back there uh, where they use that PPO network contract as a hammer and are essentially able to impose whatever pricing they want because their, their pricing will be sanitized by this illusory discount that's provided through the networks. And negotiating on a common language that's verifiable by both parties is, they're not interested in that at all. That may end up being a medical provider that you just don't wanna do business with. And our hopes are as if enough folks do that um, and demand price transparency, demand a level playing field, that that medical provider, that hospital system will change their ways and, and choose to enter uh, into the marketplace uh, as, as a, a true conscientious member of the business community. Um, anyway, so those are some of the reasons why you might wanna walk away from the agreement. This slide uh, is really just some of our uh, metrics um, and some of the results that we've experienced. Uh, we just went back to January of 2019 through April of 2020. Um, going through RBP um, here, we've, we've had almost 51,000 uh, claims that have run through uh, RBP. Um, that was on <clears throat> about 12,000 total members. Um, belly buttons that had these $50,000, 50,000 claims. Of those uh, 51,000 claims, we had 150 um, balanced bills, which is 0.026%. Um, of that percentage of balanced bills where the default values were not adequate and the medical provider balanced bill the patient, we have had 54 uh, positive resolutions. We've had one decline no or no response. 
the average uh, negotiation uh, settlement on, on those claims is 230% uh, of Medicare. Um, a lot of them are you know, emergency claims, anesthesia claims. Uh, it's where we see a lot of balance billing, the medical providers that uh, you didn't choose. <laughs> Um, and if you remember the default values for emergency department and anesthesia, uh, anesthesia, uh, Kempton are, are 200% of Medicare. So if we have to go up 30%, that's, that still provides great savings to a plan. Uh, on those, on those claims, uh, 58 million in total build charges, the plan allowed through RBP, um, 20.9 uh, million was the PPO, uh, not PPO. The RBP allowable, um, providing our clients with a total savings of, of $37 million. Um, you know, with that, and different employers look at it differently, but with some of the savings that are out there, uh, to to quote an unnamed um, plan administrator, if we've got to throw some money at a few balance bills to resolve it, but 99% of the of the bills are non-disputed we're still going to end up saving a ton of money. Um, not all employers look at it that way. Um, they may want to be a little bit more, a little bit tougher negotiator. Um, but again, those are things that are discretionary and uh, are completely within um, um, the, the employer's uh, role or, or the plan administrator's role. Um, so really that's kind of the, the end of the presentation. Um, looks like I've got like three minutes to spare, four minutes to spare. Uh, that's pretty good for me. Um, appreciate your time and your attention. And if you'd like to learn more about some of these strategies that, that we're, we're implementing uh, with our clients and, and how they may help you and your clients maintain a quality benefit plan while also containing costs, we'd love to talk to you. Um, we'd love to come and sit down and, and spend some time figuring out how we can design a, a custom plan and a custom solution that meets uh, the cultural needs of your employer and also uh, the financial um, uh, aspect as well. Um, so anyway, with all that, I'll, I'll bring it to a close and I just wanted to remind you all to stay tuned uh, for our next webinar. Should be coming out in a few months. Topic is still to be determined. Um, and just in time for renewal season. So hopefully we'll, we'll, uh, we'll have a good topic that uh, is, is timely for the renewal season. So with that, I hope everybody stays safe uh, and healthy uh, and uh, just doesn't stress out too much. It'll, uh, everything will work out just fine. And um, we appreciate y'all. Thank you. <laughs>